First, we talked about how it's at the root of narcissistic abuse. Narcissistic abuse is all about you can't be you. You need to be an extension of somebody else. And so that you're not allowed to be you creates a shame wound because it's like, I'm bad if I feel this. I'm bad if I think this. I'm bad if I do that or I'm unworthy or there's something wrong with me. All of those beliefs that fuel shame. Narcissistic abuse creates that. During week one, we talked about how important it is to understand what toxic shame looks like so that we can bring it out of our uh, subconscious and more into our conscious awareness because shame loves to hide. And shame has so much more power when we don't realize that it's active in our body. The first week, that's what we started with, understanding how it came about and how to start noticing it, how to start bringing it into our conscious awareness. And then we talked about what it looks like to overcome toxic shame. And if toxic shame is all about, I'm bad being mean, recovery is, I'm okay as I am. I'm allowed to be me, even if others don't like it. And so that's where we wanna go from the toxic shame to authenticity and self-acceptance. But I know when I was in the beginning of my journey, getting from one to the other felt like a huge gap. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance in that. Even though logically we could be like, yeah, we're allowed to like ourselves. We're allowed to be ourselves. The body doesn't feel like it's allowed. And so that's what we spent the month doing was looking at some of the steps that can help us go from one to the other. So instead of like trying to, let's imagine like you're on the first floor and you want to get to the second floor, no one's going to jump a whole staircase. You're going to get hurt, right? We go, we do the steps. Well, it's the same thing going from toxic shame to self-acceptance and um, authenticity. We want to find the steps that help us to do that, to make it more comfortable getting there. And so some of the things we talked about, one of the things um, during week two that we talked about was learning to be neutral with ourselves. And Being neutral with ourselves means we don't join the bandwagon of self-hate and putting ourselves down and pointing out the negative. But that doesn't happen because we decide, oh, I'm, I'm going to stop doing that. What recovery looks like is we start listening and noticing when we do it. I know with myself, I wasn't even aware in the beginning. Then when I started listening to my inner dialogue, basically repeat what narcissists said to me, which means their abuse became internalized and it was unconscious. So I was saying that to myself all the time. When I first realized that I was like, oh my goodness, how I'm treating myself. And so learning to be neutral with ourselves is noticing that voice because that internalized voice is a default voice. You're not choosing it. It's happening because of repetition of what you heard all the time. But what we want to start doing is instead of identifying with it and agreeing with it, we want to notice it for what it is, an internalized voice of a voice we should never have had to deal with and hear in the first place. We want to kind of view that voice the way we view like a radio station, Back in the day when we didn't have playlists and all that, we actually were listening to different stations on the radio. If something came on you didn't like, you changed it. That's what we want to start doing. We want to go from narcissists teach self-hate. We internalize it. We feel the self-hate because that's what was ingrained in us. And now we start giving our brain a choice. We're like, oh yeah, I get that. I feel that because that's what I was taught. Do I want to feel that way about myself? Do I want to see myself that way? Whose opinion is that anyway? When we start doing that, we can um, start going from that automatic blame and almost um, attacking self that shame causes us to do. It's automatic. We start attacking ourselves with our own inner dialogue. We start creating a neutral dialogue where we just notice it as an internalized voice with no positive or negative charge. That was week two. In week three, we talked about uh, shame hangovers and the reality that when we start working on shame in the beginning, I went from 
not knowing I had any to being drunk and intoxicated with it, it would come up so much in my body because now that I was looking at it, my body's like, oh, take this. And you got shame for this too. And all, all the shame was coming up so much that it was dysregulating. So one thing that we learned during week two is that it's helpful to uncover the meaning that is going on in our body when we're feeling shame. So to give an example of that and why it's it's valuable and important, when I didn't understand the meanings that were hidden in my body, in my nervous system, things that the narcissist did could dysregulate me. So let's say the narcissist was giving me the silent treatment. I would be completely emotionally devastated as if it was emotional torture, right? I didn't realize that the real torture was because of the meaning, the hidden unconscious meaning that I was making it in my nervous system. Now, don't get me wrong. The silent treatment is abusive and mean and cruel. That is a horrible behavior that somebody does. But the whole pain was coming from what I was making it mean. And as I uncovered that, I realized that on an unconscious level, I was making that mean that I was bad and unlovable. When I realized that, I was in shock. And my mind was like, I don't agree with that. And I didn't. But I couldn't change it because... My mind wasn't the one that made that connection. It was because of unhealed trauma from the past. Narcissists love to put their their hooks in your unhealed trauma. Once we can uncover meanings and we can start separating their, their behavior from what we make it mean, it starts helping us with the shame. So for example, with that, I started to be able to notice that person's behavior I changed it to meaning that they are being uncruel, they are being unloving and cruel. Not anything about me. It was about what that behavior was meaning. Was that's bad behavior. That is unhealthy behavior. When that happened, I could stand in what what was going on. I could, my body was able to be with what was happening inside of me because of their bad behavior. That was week two, uncovering the meanings. Week three. We talked about the charge of shame. And and the fact that we have emotional hangovers is because of how shame feels in the body. It's the biology of shame. Um, And what happens with that, especially because most of our wounds started in childhood, when shame comes up in our body, it's so overwhelming that our survival brain causes us to dissociate from it. So it's like the shame comes up, we go into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And so during week three, we talked about building our body's capacity to be with shame. That's really important. We can't learn our way through shame. We can't intellectual intellectualize our way through shame. We have to be able to have it in our body to work with it. And yet, since it's so uncomfortable and overwhelming, we want to do it in a way that feels comfortable. And so I put two exercises up. The first one was a titration exercise, which starts letting you put the shame in your body in tiny doses so it doesn't create emotional dysregulation. It's very much like adding baking soda and um, what is it? Is it vinegar? Baking soda and vinegar. When you add them, you get like that reaction. Well, if you add them in small doses, it just is a light little sizzle. We want to titrate with shame. We don't want to get this overwhelming emotional dysregulation. If we're doing that, that means we're pushing our body too much. And usually that happens because the mind wants to work through it. But we have to honor the body's capacity. Just like I can go to the gym and my mind wanted, may want to be able to lift, you know, 100 pounds, but my body isn't there. Well, emotionally, it can be the same way. So the titration exercise is to start helping you to build capacity. It's not one of those exercises you do once. Honestly, I titrated with um, shame for probably months. 
on a regular basis. It was part of my daily routine. So I encourage you to make that exercise, even if five minutes, not a lot, you don't want to overdo it with shame. Five minutes of titrating with shame a day. You'll get to the point where you can be with it. And that's when you go to the next exercise that we did during week three, which was track the charge. Once you can be with it without a lot of dysregulation, now you can sit with it and learn, learn what's stuck in the nervous system. So that was week three. That's another exercise that took months. It's not, again, it's not do this exercise and now next week you're healed. It's do these exercises regularly and your nervous system is going to be going through a rewiring process that you're going to be amazed with if you stick with it. Week four, we talked about after being able to track the charge and sit with it for a period of time where you know that your body's capacity is okay with it, then you want to start figuring out which channels in the body are not together. So for example, we went through the um, acronym of CYBAM, which is something that I learned in somatic experiencing. They're the five channels that the body uses to digest strong um, emotions or trauma. And if we don't have all five, the nervous system can't file it away. It can't put it in long-term memory. So it stays like on the counter and it's re-traumatizing us over and over again. And so those five channels, just for the sake of anyone that's new and or hopped on this week, CYBAM, CYBAM stands for sensation, um, image, behavior, affect, or meaning. I'm sorry, affect or emotion. And then the M is for meaning. And so when you move on to that stage of the exercises, when you're tracking your charge and you're comfortable with the shame, you want to ask it. What sensation is here? Name it. Where is it? Be curious about it. What image does this bring up? Image often will bring you to either a memory or if not a memory, it will be an image of how your nervous system or your subconscious is showing you, your conscious self, what it felt like. So I mentioned to you guys about my three-year-old self in a dungeon. I was never in a dungeon. I was never, you know, with my head down and not able to look up, but to my body, that's what it felt like. And so you, my body helps me to see what that feels like. Then you can work with that image. We'll learn more how to work with it um, as we do like demos and things like that. As, as you see me working with somebody else, you'll learn how to do that for yourself as well. Um, behavior, affect, and meaning, same thing asking like, what be, what behavior does this cause in me? Or what behavior does my body want to do now to help this energy move through me? Affect emotions. Naming our emotions is huge because most of the time, if we experience trauma in childhood, we had no idea what shame meant, what uh, emotional pain meant, what rejection meant, but we knew what it felt like. But there's a phrase, name it to tame it. When we name our emotions, we're basically saying, I see you. And when our emotions feel seen, there's like a soothing. They're like, oh, you, you see me, you care. So that was week four. We went through that with Cybam. This week, we're going to talk about psychological mirrors. 